Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Clean Rooms, for having me here. It's a pleasure. I came all the way from St. Louis, Missouri. So I'm going to use both of these mics when I give my talk here. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about contamination control strategy as it relates to ATMP clean rooms. So if anybody's from U.S., that's cell and gene therapy clean rooms. There's my background. I'm the current president for the um, PDA Missouri Valley chapter, and I'm the vice president for membership for IEST. So I've been involved with the industry for 23 years, so it keeps me busy. So we're going to talk a little bit about contamination control strategy. One of the key points to it is to have a holistic approach to contamination control in your clean room. And you'll see here that uh, that first statement is really a, a critical thing when we talk about CCS programs, and that is that uh, contamination control, it's taking the steps to minimize contamination and risk of contamination, not just from microorganisms, but from particles, from endotoxins in your clean room. And it also involves, if you look here at our uh, house of contamination control, which, which we created, uh, basically the holistic approach, you have all these contamination controls down here, and let's see if the laser works. Yeah, it does. So it's things such as personnel training, hygiene training, uh, looking over and auditing your vendors, equipment design, cleaning and disinfection, uh, facility and utility management, and it's all these things combined, so all the different areas of your clean room operation combined uh, that make for a good CCS program. And it's also continuous improvement. So one of the objectives with the rewrite and the, the edits to the Annex 1 is when you have an opportunity to implement new technology, such as rapid micro methods or bringing in open, can, open RABs for production to do this. And you are going to see in the next probably 10 years in the industry the use of robots more in the industry, not only for production, but even for cleaning. So we're seeing lots of changes, you know, in the, in the years to come. So a holistic contamination control strategy, you should have an oversight committee that kind of keeps tabs on everything. You, again, should have this... Uh, continuous improvement program where you improve things as you can so as rapid micro methods become available if for example there's new methods for environmental monitoring and data trending you can implement those kinds of methods regulators now not just the FDA are proposing some of these but MHRA and your different European regulators too and as I said here there's several foundations to all of this at the bottom which are personnel awareness, having a quality culture, having a quality risk management program, and having good scientific knowledge that backs up everything you're doing. We know contamination in clean rooms comes from many different sources. It comes from aging facilities, things like breaking down a ductwork over time. When we look at the clean room floor, uh, the sealants on the floor break down over time. It also comes from material transfer, uh, into the clean room, anything you bring into the clean room can potentially be a source of contamination. Uh, obviously, operators, Tim Sandel wrote a great article a few years ago uh, in the PDA Journal where he looked at, you know, the most common sources of contamination, and number one is always operators and people. We account for about 80 to 85 percent of the contamination. Organisms like Staphylococcus and Micrococcus, they come from us. We shed these in in the clean room. Oops, let me go back here. Uh, and then your process, so whatever your process is in the clean room, that can also add to contamination if it's a very wet process or a process that uh, if you're dealing work with uh, powders uh, or tablets, all of these can uh, contribute to the contamination. Utilities, so things like water systems, water for injection systems, seems to kind of fade off. It's strange. I'm not even touching it and it moves. Maybe a ghost. I have a ghost in the screen there. It's not me. <laughs> it's not me either. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so utilities can be a source of it. Uh, compressed gases. So some organisms like Cutibacterium acnes, the organism that causes bad acne, 
Some operators, if they touch their face and they have acne and they touch surfaces in a room, they can actually spread that organism and it lives in aerobic and anaerobic environments. And then where you place equipment in a room can affect things as well. It can affect first air, it can affect your HEPA filtered air in the clean room if you're blocking vents, and that all can contribute as well. This is an important table because if we look at the hierarchy of resistance, it talks about what are the most difficult organisms to kill in the clean room versus the easiest. And I'll point out here that some of the easiest are down here at the bottom. Your envelope viruses like HIV-1, herpes, hepatitis, coronavirus, and your gram-positive cocci, so staph and micrococcus. Whereas some of your most difficult to kill and most problematic in cell and gene are your mold spores and your uh, bacterial endospores like uh, Bacillus um, cereus and Bacillus subtilis. This is a nice uh, rendition here uh, in terms of what are the most common products used in the clean room to control bio burden in the room. So up at the top of the spectrum, we have your sporicidal agent. <clears throat> That's designed to kill the, the hardest to kill organisms that you see in there, like your mold spores and your bacterial endospores. In the middle is what we call the workhorse of your program. Thomas uh, Rista calls it that from FDA. And that's your phenolic disinfectants and your quaternary ammoniums. Those are designed to both clean and provide moderate level of kill. And then at the bottom, and it's actually most frequently used, are your alcohols. That's because every time you go in the clean room, what do you do when you put your gloves on? Spray them down with alcohol, right? So you use a lot of alcohol in the transfer process into the room. And then you look at sanitizers, the most common sanitizers used in the clean room 70% IPA and 70% ethanol. So these are very good at controlling gram-positive organisms and some of your lower end molds. And then we have the disinfectants, so the quaternary ammoniums and the phenolics. <coughs> these will both clean what's on the surface because they contain surfactants and provide a moderate level of kill. So you see these used a lot both in Europe, the US and other parts of the globe. And then you have the sterilant or sporicide. This is designed to kill everything in the room, including the hardest to kill organisms, uh, such as spores. And that's a big concern, especially in cell and gene therapy, because you don't want to be getting spores into your BSC hood. And I wanted to mention here, disinfectants are made of many key components. So it's not just water, which is the solvent. You've also got the antimicrobial, the phenol or the quat molecule itself that kills the organism. You've got uh, keylants that bind up hard water ions and allow uh, the chemistry to be more effective. You've got co-solvents that stabilize the formula. <clears throat> and then you've got the um, pH range of it, making it acidic or basic, which actually kills microorganisms too, because microbes love to li uh, live between a pH of four and eight. And then most importantly, when we talk about disinfectants, they also clean and they penetrate into the surface. So that's what the surfactants do. Oh, so I'm jumping ahead and I'm not even touching the controller here. All right. All of these parameters directly affect performance, things such as pH, temperature. So if you're using a product in a cold room, cold room temperatures of minus five to five C will slow down the chemistry. So it may take a longer contact time. <clears throat> when it comes to uh, contact time, that's also very critical. So Thomas Arista from FDA would tell you the way he monitors contact time is a calibrated stopwatch. He'll click it when the, you start to wet the room with disinfectant, click it when it dries. So you should periodically monitor that to make sure that you've got enough wet contact time. I'm being moved along without my even touching it. <laughs> and. Um, Concentration is important too, because if you don't make up the product correctly, you're not gonna have the right concentration of actives to kill the microorganism. And of course, surfaces. So when I apply disinfectant to the surface, some surfaces you'll get better penetration and kill, like stainless steel and glass, versus some of the epoxy surfaces. So when do I need to worry about disinfection versus cleaning? Some clean rooms, like if you do tissue banking, 
you may have more, uh, con more potential contamination in the room from cells, from cell debris. So you may need a separate cleaning step first with a neutral or basic cleaner uh, before you come in and use the disinfectant. So it just depends on, you know, really what you're doing, whether you need that additional cleaning step. How surfactants work, I don't know why that moved, but if you look here, <coughs> if I just add alcohol or water, it beads up on the surface and you don't get that penetration into the surface. But when I add a surfactant-based product to the surface here, you'll notice it penetrates in and it removes the molecules and the organisms and dead organisms from that surface. So that's why it's so critical to use a surfactant-based disinfectant routinely in the clean room. And one of the things we wanted to study, and we published this in a PDA book chapter a few years ago, is effectiveness at pass-through decon. So we did want to look at that, and up here in this example, we looked at mold spores, so Aspergillus brasiliensis. <clears throat> and you'll see we looked at <coughs> three different common surfaces, so 316 stainless steel, self-seal pouches, and polycarbonate, which is Lexan. And what we see here is we're looking at a five-minute contact time of the sporicide, and then we had the sporicide plus 70% IPA, and the sporicide uh, was a hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid-based chemistry. And you'll see we get complete kill here in a five-minute time. Because you have the greater than sign, that means we're seeing complete kill in five minutes. So that's very good performance on those surfaces. And then we look at Bacillus subtilis, which is a harder to kill organism. It's a bacterial spore. The same surfaces, 316 stainless, uh, self-sealed pouch, polycarbonate, which is Lexan. And again, <clears throat> in that five-minute contact time, we're seeing almost the two log reduction, uh, which is stated in USP General Chapter 1072 uh, for coupon testing. So that's still pretty good efficacy in only five minutes. Because if you think about this also in the clean room, you're going to see very low levels of organisms anyway. If we're talking about 100 or 200 organisms, is it really a clean room? Probably not, right? So some other options. You can use sporicidal wipes. There's bleach wipes out there, hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid. You can use ready-to-use chemistry. So those are very popular over here. Uh, those work really well at the cleaning and the penetration into the surface. And it's important to actually test the chemi chemistry to see how effective it is. So here, I'm not even doing that. It's a mystery. Here, we're looking at Aspergillus brasiliensis, and you can tell the sporicidal chemistries here are much more effective, <coughs> pardon me, than 6% uh, hydrogen peroxide. The problem with 6% is it takes a real long time uh, to build up that efficacy. So with 6%, you might be looking at 45 minutes to an hour, and how many of you want to wait an hour in the clean room to kill spores? Not too many people, right? <clears throat> and we see the same phenomena with bacterial spores, uh, Bacillus subtilis, with 6% not being as effective. So it's really critical to test your sporicidal agent to see how efficacious it is. And that's the same tables. It comes from a, um, a PDA poster from a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and so when you decide to choose a chemistry to use in the clean room, whether it's a disinfectant or a sporicide, it's really important here, I don't know why it keeps moving on me, to look at the different, <laughs> it's not you doing it in the back. Okay. Okay. Well, it's good in the sense it tells me to move along, so, you know. Uh, but it's important to uh, balance, and this is a balance here, decide what's the most important criteria in choosing the organism, or choosing the chemistry to kill the organisms in the room. <coughs> Pardon me, my allergies or something else in the hotel. Um, but I would say here, efficacy is usually number one in, in terms of what... Uh, pharma, biopharma customers are looking at. 
outside of uh, that and it changed again. Go back here. <coughs> Another key criteria, compatibility. Uh, use dilution, open container stability. Safety and disposal and rinsing. And there was a recent PDA article that came out during the time of the, um, during the start of the pandemic and uh, the BPOG group put this together <coughs> and in it they wanted to look at what, um, what are the most important criteria in choosing disinfectants and sporicides. And they found the same thing. Things such as disposal, compatibility, efficacy are all really critical. All right, cell and gene therapy. I want to present a case study on that here where I talk a little bit about mold contamination. <clears throat> so whether it's allogeneic or autologous, the same process takes place in cell and gene. Boy, that's annoying that it does that. <clears throat> and um, you come into the clean room and you've got a cooler with the thawed blood in it, so you would want to wipe down the outside of that cooler with a sporicidal wipe or spray it down and then wipe it. <clears throat> then you're going to do some manipulation of those cells in a BSC hood. So you're going to be basically isolating T cells or natural killer cells. This is used a lot with cancer therapies, so very sick cancer patients. Then you're going to uh, basically put the cells in an incubator and multiply them and grow them up. So one of the key things I'm going to talk about with the incubator you have to be very careful of getting contamination in the gasket around it. <coughs> because mold loves to live in that gasket material, like aspergillus, and you need to decontaminate that with the sporocyte. Then you're going to harvest the cells, fill them in bags, and cryo-freeze them at minus 80 or below. And then they're sent out to either a single patient or multiple patients. So some key products uh, that you can use during that process are 70% IPA for spraying items down that you bring into the room, such as that uh, cooler when you bring it in with the cells. Uh, you can use sporicidal wipes, especially uh, when it comes to the BSC hood. After each patient run, you would want to use a sporicide inside the hood. And then you would want to wipe the hood with 70% IPA to remove any of the stabilizer in it. And then if we look at the case study, uh, the case study was, I've actually seen this at a couple of ATMP sites, um, aspergillus uh, outbreak. So aspergillus is a um, fungal spore. It's fairly difficult to kill. And one of the things that I saw when we did some investigation into this, I worked with a consultant uh, from Valsource on this, is they were doing excessive rinsing in the clean room with potable water. How many people think potable water is a good idea? Not a good idea, right? They were also using just 70% IPA to clean the BSC hood. Is that the best product to use? Not at all. The tacky mats were completely black and they were never cleaned. Do you need to clean the tacky mat? Absolutely. I'm, I'm really not changing this every time. Uh, the mop heads were all black. How many people think you should have black mop heads? No, right? And the dilution of the sporocyte and the disinfectant were not correct. They were completely off. So as an example, they were diluting the sporocyte 1 to 100, and I recommended 1 to 32. So that's a big difference in dilution. So what are the next steps in the investigation? Well, now we have to kind of drill down into each of these to find some assignable causes, right? Because Thomas Arista from FDA would say, you need to have realistic assignable causes. We can't come up with just a bunch of uh, potential causes that don't make any sense. It needs to make sense. So you can do the fishbone diagram like we did here. I know Dr. Scott Sutton and I used to you know, joke around and, and work on these quite a bit when we were doing some research together. But come, you can isolate each one of these, people, measurement, materials, machine and method, and what can potentially be contributing to the contamination. Uh, the previous speaker talked about Gemba walks. So going to the floor, going to the shop floor, seeing what co is going on down there. 
Believe it or not, one of the investigations I did a few years ago, uh, the clean room had a canine bio burden picked up, you know, on the EM. And sure enough, we looked at the video and 2.30 in the morning, the security guard goes walking through the clean room with his German Shepherd. So it's a great opportunity for Kimberly Clark to make gowning material for the puppy, right? <clears throat> Another tool that we can use in the tool shed are the five Ys. So when we use the five Y tool, you can start to drill down on each of the causes. Why are we using potable water? Can you not afford water for injection? Do you not have a still? Can you buy it? <clears throat> and you would dr drill down into each one of these. So <clears throat> when it comes to diluting the uh, disinfectant and sporicide incorrectly, why is that happening? Have your operators not been trained properly? <clears throat> when it comes to uh, just using 70% IPA on a BSC hood, do you have access to the sporicide? Can you get it in wipes? Can you get it in a spray? Right? Those would make things easier for cleaning the hood. Oh, now I'm not moving at all. There we go. Okay. So here's your BSC hood, right? This needs to be cleaned routinely with the sporicide because the two biggest risks in there are going to be from bacterial and fungal spores. And your best efficacy will be from the sporicide. And you do need to rinse <clears throat> because if you get buildup of um, the stabilizer inside there, uh, that can be a residue that you don't want to get into your product that you're uh, making for the patient. <clears throat> and the biggest source that I have seen in a lot of these cell and gene sites, so ATMP sites, has been the incubator. So this gasket here on the outside, that can get wet and moist. Mold can get in there into the nooks and crannies of it, and you really need to get a sporicide in there, either with a wipe or spray, to kill that mold. And sometimes you may have to replace that gasket. <clears throat> because from my experience, that is probably one of the top two sources of contamination and cell and gene, besides the operator. The other thing is anything you bring into the clean room especially when it comes in on carts or anything with wheels, <clears throat> that can be a source of, uh, of spores. And I can't tell you how many times I go in and do an audit or come to a facility, and they'll say, Jim, we have all dedicated carts here. I look out the window, and guess what's coming in across the parking lot? The dedicated carts. So they're not very dedicated. So it's important to decontaminate those. You can put a sporicidal wipe on the floor, and roll the wheel over it. You can spray it down with sporicide. You can put it through a VHP pass-through. Uh, there's even a couple of clean room sites in the U.S. and the Northeast that built little troughs in the floor in the pass-through where the wheels sit in that trough uh, totally covered with sporicide for about 20 minutes. And it kills anything on them. So those are all options. And then when we talk about these open rabs, you're going to see open rabs coming into the cell and gene therapy area because we're trying to take people out of the contamination equation. So back to the rabs, and I swear I'm not doing that, but it's doing it. It's moving me. Uh, when you look at the rabs, if you have to open it up and get in there and clean because you have a broken vial or you have something that is tipped over in the isolator, uh, in the rabs rather, you want to very carefully uh, use a tool and attach it to an IPA wipe that's sterile and go into that sterile zone and you always want to go from the um, essentially the most critical area to the least critical. So you've got to make sure you're wiping correctly so you're not spreading that contamination. That's a big thing and you need to be trained on that. So at PDA with the aseptic course we'll train you on how to do that. Annex 1 talks a lot about pass-through decon. It's very critical that you have a process in place that's effective, that addresses that. No, I'm not moving at all. There we go. And you definitely need to, uh, in all of your clean rooms when you're bringing materials in, I would probably recommend the first step as a sporicide. If it's not compatible with the sporicide, then I'd look at 70% IPA. And fungal contamination, as I said, has been mentioned many times in recent FDA warning letters 
and FDA 483. So we know that it's a big issue out there. And the question I always have is, if you get one hit from a fungal spore in a clean room, does that mean you go crazy and investigate it from here to Tuesday? Or does that mean you should be trending that data and maybe come up with limits for mold in the facility? Because is it realistic, and this is something we brought up at PDA at the annual meeting, is it realistic to say that we're going to have zero mold for all of our clean rooms? What do you guys think? It's not possible. You're periodically going to have mold. So that should be part of your EM program, how to address that. Uh, and as my previous speaker said, we do need to validate the disinfectants. It's mentioned in Annex 1, and I was actually talking to a uh, biopharmacite in Singapore the other day, and it came up uh, from their end, once we do all this work and spend all this money to validate it, do we have to do it again? The answer to that is right here in this recent 483 by FDA. When you get these older antiquated studies, maybe the methods have changed, Maybe you missed some areas in terms of looking at the bio burden. What about in a gowning room? Did you account for all the organisms you're seeing there and the new materials in there? If you have a new flooring, and they kind of, going back here to that um, 483, you can see they call out all these different things. They talk about the gowning room. It wasn't included in the original study. Should it be? Sure. So you should take these things into account, and that should be part of your risk assessment. <clears throat> and certainly, if you have an operator that's working in a BSC hood and selling gene therapy, and you plate them after they come out of there, and you pick up catomium, which is a very hard to kill fungal spore, and aspergillus, would that make it a concern to you? Absolutely, right? So that would definitely warrant an investigation. You should look into that. One of my favorite ones is black or brown stains on the ceiling. So I was at a facility in Rio uh, where I look up at the ceiling and I see all these black and brown stains and they had a pipe break above the ceiling. And the way they addressed it was they poured concentrated sporicide on the end of the pipe. Is that the best way to address that? No, you need to seal it, right? And certainly using a sporicide is a good idea, but I would seal it and you've got to take care of where all that moisture came from. The other uh, thing about the facility I found interesting is they told me they turned off the um, HVAC system at night to boost their profits. Is that a good idea? Not at all. <clears throat> so mold is a problem. In this uh, recent 483, <clears throat> they actually found a cap line on a filled product with mold growing around the cap of it. So that's a concern, right? And certainly dark material. I remember doing an audit at a facility in Lyon, and you looked at the bottom of these curtains, and you saw black mold growing around the bottom. And they're trying to tell me that that's the normal color of the curtain. How many people believe that? It's not the color of the curtain. Uh, cladosporium is also an issue, especially with IV bags, because when you have these conveyor belt systems and you've got... IV bags on it with saline or antibiotic, they tend to leak, make it very sticky, and that's a source of contamination. And let me get on from some of this. So uh, having a good risk-based approach when you do have contamination is essential. Okay? And you need to think about this. If you've got a mold issue, is it toxic? Is it pathogenic? <clears throat> is it something that affects multiple areas of the facility? And Amy McDaniel would tell you, she's with uh, BMS now, uh, well-known microbiologist in our industry. You also need to do, find out if you've got mold in three different areas of the site, is it the same genus and species? Why is that important? It might be three different investigations, right? So that's important to note that. Where have you seen the mold or the contamination? Is it in your water system? Is it in your... Uh, gowning room? Is it in your sterility testing suite? So you need to be looking at all these different areas. And then one of the biggest questions I always have when I go to sites that tell me uh, they have a mold issue, and this is where I really get fun with it, is I said, well, okay, how many hits have you had? And I hear a lot of times, one. 
So I'm spending five hours in a conversation with a team of managers over one mold hit. And it was from a random sample on a process skid. So again, that goes back to what I said earlier. You need to be trending the levels of organisms in the room, including mold. Does one hit constitute a big investigation? So disinfecting the molds. Going back here, most effective chemistry is going to be up here at the top, your sporocyte. Disinfectants will have some effect as well. <clears throat> and we know that mold spores are going to be the worst case part of the mold to disinfect. So in an article that I published in Germany in a journal, one of the things we found is cotomium is actually your worst case mold that we've seen in clean rooms. Sure, there's other molds, but that's usually going to be your worst case. <clears throat> Following that, you would have aspergillus, uh, penicillium, which I have a, a conference call this afternoon with an um, end user in the U.S. that's got penicillium outbreak going on. Uh, Cladosporium, trichophyton, which is, which is the foot mold, and candida, which is a yeast. That would be the spectrum in terms of efficacy. So this would be the most difficult to kill of the molds. And mold on a plate, when I grow it up, the little white hair-like projections, those are the conidia spores of the mold, and those are what will bud off, and as Tim Sandel says, when they get in the clean room, they're spread by the airflow patterns, and they spread to different surfaces in the room. So they're essentially carried by the airstream. This facility used a high impingement sprayer to spray disinfectant on the walls, and the problem with it, the velocity of it is set too high, and it punches out holes through the wall to the sheetrock. And as a consequence, let me show you what the wall looked like right there. Is that a problem? That's a problem. I wouldn't show the FDA that. I think that could be a difficult discussion. <clears throat> and the little mold spores look like this from aspergillus. They have the little spiny spores on them. And uh, they're unique in that they can get into the corners and crevices in the clean room, including uh, here's a piece of flooring. <clears throat> and if you look at this, see how they get into the crevices of my epoxy floor? That's an issue. And this is just a good example where we did some testing with some new phenolic chemistries against ketomium over here and against aspergillus here. And what do you see from the table? Ketomium is much more difficult to kill, as I mentioned. You're going to need a sporicide. You may need a cleaner and a sporicide to, to kill it. And we can tell when we do a survey of different molds, as I mentioned earlier, going back here to this slide, aspergillus is going to be your worst case. Um, candida is going to be much easier to kill. And surfaces make a big difference. So when we look at glass, as you can see from our studies here with phenols and IPA, glass is going to be pretty easy to kill organisms on. So will stainless steel 316, however, when we start to look at flooring, it's a little sketchier, and that's because it's more porous. The more porous it is, the more difficult it will be to get high levels of kill on it. And that goes especially for vinyl flooring as well. How important is contact time? What if I just get a one-minute contact time? Is that long enough? What do you guys think? No. Contact time is really important. It is something FDA has highlighted in warning letters and 483s. And again, here in this 483, they highlight it too. I will tell you that um, contact time, it's really important to monitor it periodically and make sure you get the surfaces wet long enough because it's while the surface is wet that the biocidal agent is killing the organism. And we actually did an article on contact time we published over here in a French journal. Ineffective cleaning methods. This is a good tale to look at. <clears throat> so not having good cleaning methods can be a problem, especially in the ISO 5 area. Let's move to an example here. Here we go. So a bunch of particles on my clean room surface. And with the black light, this is an ineffective cleaning method. This is me cleaning the car, right? So we do the wipe on, wipe off method, like I'm waxing my car. Is that an effective cleaning method? See what I'm doing? I'm just spreading contamination all over the wall. It's not really cleaning. I'm a spreader. 
super spreader, right? But effective cleaning chemistry and effective elbow grease will be very effective. So if you do unidirectional overlapping strokes by roughly 20% or two inches, you get very good uh, cleaning on the surface. We show that here. And that should be the objective, whether it's a microfiber mop, polyester mop, or a wipe. And you can fold the wipe in the fourths and use a clean side each time you wipe the surface. This just shows the overlapping strokes. <clears throat> and this is a schematic for a two bucket and three bucket cleaning routine. I always like to, when I go to a site, actually see them cleaning. Uh, I can tell you from a big vaccine production site up in Pennsylvania, I watched them clean and it looked like uh, Niagara Falls in the clean room. There was just water everywhere. You should never have that much water in the clean room. And they were taking, taking the mop head from the ISO 5 room and carrying it out to the gowning room and then bring it back in. Should that mop head be traveling like that? No. Cleaning BSC hoods. I always recommend a spore aside. You can spray it or wipe it on there. Uh, when it comes to tools, wiping it down with a sporicidal wipe or uh, spraying it with the sporicide is best practice. Drains are a big concern. I see a lot of times, like up in New Jersey, white little hair-like projections coming up from the drain. And you know what that is? That's not Jersey water. That is penicillium mold growing up from the drain. It's a big concern. So we highlight drains in Annex 1 and in PDA's Tech Report 70 as an area for biofilm growth, growth and mold growth. So lastly, rotation can be one disinfectant and one sporicide. That's perfectly fine here in Europe or the US. PDA's Tech Report 70 talks about that, so does Annex 1. And in terms of rinsing, if you have significant residue buildup, that is very difficult to remove and residue comes from many different sources, as I'll show you here. Uh, people, things you bring into the room in carts. <clears throat> the way you can remove it is with a cleaner followed by a rinse step with WFI. But in general, in clean rooms, water for injection, for uh, floors and walls works very well, and 70% IPA for glass and stainless steel. So certainly if the rinsing, if you have residue buildup and it causes an appearance issue or it's a safety issue making floors sticky, tacky, or slippery, then I would definitely recommend rinsing. <clears throat> and here's a good example when you would want to try to rinse. The stainless steel door, that's very heavy residue. You may need a cleaner to remove it. <clears throat> and finally, I want to talk about how to do a field trial, a triple clean. <clears throat> and I do recommend doing this in a clean room, whether it's cell and gene therapy, biopharma, compounding pharmacy. Uh, and the way you can do a triple clean is to, to um, essentially after a worst case event, you would take environmental monitoring data. So after a shutdown, power failure, construction event, show how dirty the facility is. Then you would use your disinfectant twice, followed by the sporicide. So let's show you what that looks like. So here's the clean room after a construction event. Lots of bio burden in the room. See that? Spores, vegetated bio burden, it's a mess. Especially the gowning area right here. See that? So the way you mop, you will start at the most critical area where we have RABs and BSC hoods and you work your way out. You never start in the gowning room and go into the aseptic area. <clears throat> and then we'll use the disinfectant like a quaternary ammonium twice you can take monitoring data after each step. And then we come in and we nuke the place with the sporicide. Kills everything in the room. Now you may not have all zeros because occasionally the dog or the person comes walking back in there or the cart. But the idea is you see a significant reduction in that bio burden. So I recently published a study with Novartis and I'm working on one now with Charles River. Uh, and I think that you know, anytime you can show this data in the industry, FDA regulators love it, MHRA loves it. I think it's a good positive thing because it shows under real world conditions, the products you're using in the room are effective. And that, now it's not even moving on me here. There we go. There's all my references. 
and my contact information. Thanks for your time. Sorry about the slide movement there. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, that was excellent. Any questions for Jim? Anyone got any questions? No? No questions. No, that's excellent then, yeah. Well, well explained. That was really a new one for me. German Shepherds in clean rooms. Never, 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 never had a German Shepherd in a clean room before, so that's a, a new one. Thank you.